Hi, I'm Dr. Ruth Horowitz with Bay West Endocrinology Associates, located here at GBMC in the North Pavilion. I will be giving the third in a series of lectures on the management of type 2 diabetes. The first lecture was given by Dr. James Mercy and spoke about the initial management of type 2 diabetes. Dr. Mina Khan spoke about additional therapy in patients who have failed initial therapy. And I will be speaking about insulin management in type 2 diabetics. If you remember, we were following a patient who was on metformin therapy and Victoza, and we are going to pick him up a little bit further down the line. The patient's now 55 years old and has been seeing me regularly for the past two years. He's been exercising twice a week and trying to watch his diet, but unfortunately, his finger stick glucose levels are rising, and his fasting glucose is running 180 to 250, and his bedtime readings are in the 280 range. His current medications include metformin, 1,000 milligrams twice a day, Victoza, 1.8 milligram once a day, Lisinopril, 10 milligrams once a day, Amlodipine, 10 milligrams once a day, and Simvastatin, 20 milligrams once a day. On physical exam, his weight is 210 pounds, height 5 foot 10 inches, and his BMI is 30.24. His blood pressure is 118 over 72, and his pulse is 75. His eyes reveal a fundoscopic exam with rare microhemorrhages, so now he's developed some early retinopathy. Lung and heart exam is unremarkable. Abdomen is obese with no enlarged liver or spleen. His pulses are 2 plus. On neuro exam, he has decreased vibration sense bilaterally with intact monofilament sensation bilaterally. This indicates early peripheral neuropathy. Laboratory data reveals a fasting glucose of 194. His hemoglobin A1C is elevated at 9.2%. Total cholesterol is 192. His triglycerides are elevated at 182. HDL is 35, a little bit low, and his LDL is 96. Given the fact that he does not have established heart disease, LDL goal of below 100 is where he's at right now. If he had had a coronary event, I would want his LDL to be below 70. His microalbumin to creatinine ratio is slightly elevated at 75, so he has early nephropathy. This slide summarizes the natural history of type 2 diabetes. The progression of type 2 diabetes can be characterized as a progressive imbalance between insulin demand and insulin supply. Insulin demand increases in patients with increased caloric consumption, decreased physical activity, and increased age. Patients who are unable to compensate for the increased insulin demand can develop prediabetes, and this progresses onto type 2 diabetes as supply declines. In the progression onto type 2 diabetes, pancreatic beta cells respond initially by increasing their insulin output in an attempt to meet the demand. Despite the increase in insulin production, the hormone supply is insufficient to produce glycemic control. Beta cell function declines. Hyperglycemia develops. Initially, postprandial glucoses rise, soon followed by fasting hyperglycemia. The complications of macrovascular and microvascular changes begin well in advance of the clinical diagnosis of diabetes. This slide summarizes the ADA targets for glucose control. We would like to have an A1C below 7% with a pre-meal glucose of less than 130 and a two-hour post-meal glucose of less than 180, although we need to individualize these targets for the patient. In younger patients, we shoot for a tighter control with an A1C between 6 and 6.5. I often shoot to have their post-meal glucose less than 140 to 160. In older patients, especially those with coexisting conditions such as heart disease, we want to have a looser target with an A1C of 7.5 to 8 percent. Above all, we need to avoid hypoglycemia. This is a slide that you have seen in prior presentations and is a fairly busy slide, but this highlights the multiple different combinations one can use to achieve glycemic control. Insulin can be added earlier in the treatment of diabetes if glucose levels are more uncontrolled. The dashed arrow on the left side of the figure 
denotes the option of a more rapid progression from two drug therapy to multiple daily injections of insulin in those patients with severe hyperglycemia, and A1C is between 10 and 12. One could consider starting with insulin in a patient who presents with very high glucoses over 350, with or without catabolic features such as weight loss or ketosis. This slide summarizes the different insulin therapies that are now available to us. We have NPH, which I'm sure everyone is familiar with, regular insulin, and then the newer insulins, basal insulins, glargine and detimer, which are Lantus and Levomir, and the rapid-acting analogs, Lyspro, Aspart, and Gluzlazine, which are Humalog, Novolog, and Apidra. There are also premixed varieties of insulins. This is a diagrammatic representation of the various insulins that we have in our armamentarium. To the left side of the slide are the rapid-acting insulin, who have a very quick onset of action and shorter duration. NPH, intermediate-acting insulin, has a midline onset and duration, and the long-acting insulins have a much flatter profile with no real peak and a longer duration of action. This figure describes the number of injections required at each stage together with complexity and flexibility. One can start with basal insulin initially and then add additional injections of insulin. As you increase in numbers of injections, you also increase in complexity. Increasing in insulin injections, however, gives you increased flexibility. Insulin is usually started with basal insulin, beginning with 0.1, to 0.2 units per kilogram per body weight, depending on the degree of hyperglycemia. This is usually prescribed in conjunction with one or two non-insulin agents. Once one progresses on to multiple daily injections, many of the oral agents are discontinued. The basal insulins we have available to us at this time are the long-acting insulin, which include Lantus and Levomir. They have no peak, they have a longer duration of action and have less risk of hypoglycemia. Generally, they also cause less weight gain. The intermediate acting insulin, MPH, has an onset of action in about two to four hours, peaks in four to 10 hours, and has a duration of about 12 to 18 hours. It has a much lower cost, but a more variable absorption and higher risk of hypoglycemia. When basal insulin has been titrated to an acceptable fasting plasma glucose, but the A1C remains above target, or postprandial glucose levels are still high, one must consider progressing on in this algorithm by adding mealtime insulin or considering a premixed insulin. Non-insulin agents can be continued, although the sulfonylureas and other insulin secretagogues are typically stopped once you are adding mealtime insulin. The premixed insulins we have available include Human 7030, which has 70% MPH and 30% regular. Novolog Mix is 70% aspart protamine and 30% aspart. And Humalog Mix comes in two varieties a 75% lispro protamine, 25% lispro, or a 50 50, 50% 50 lispro protamine and 50% lispro. This is taken generally either with the largest meal, but I tend to start it with the two largest meals, breakfast and dinner. You adjust the AM dose based on the pre-dinner glucose, therefore seeing the effect of the morning injection. And you adjust your PM dose based on what the fasting glucose is the next day, thus seeing the effect of that injection from the night before through to the next morning. Premixed insulin lacks flexibility, however, you can't adjust the components of the mixed insulin. So if a patient needs more mealtime coverage and less basal insulin, you cannot adjust those components separately. And therefore, there is a higher risk of both hypoglycemia and hyperglycemia. The more flexible but more complicated alternative to premixed insulin is basal insulin with one to three injections of mealtime insulin. The rapid-acting insulins that we have available to us are regular insulin, which has a delayed onset of 30 to 60 minutes, more variable absorption, and a peak in about 2 to 4 hours. It lasts about 6 to 8 hours. Analog insulin, which include Humalog, Novolog, and Apidra, have a rapid onset of 15 minutes, a shorter duration of action of about 4 to 5 hours, and are more effective in lowering post-meal glucose levels. 
they carry a lower risk of hypoglycemia. These are my preferred mealtime insulins. Basal bolus insulin provides increased flexibility and is good for patients with variable food intake or irregular meal patterns. The bolus dose is adjusted based on carbohydrate intake and glucose levels. A patient can either be given a more set pre-meal dose of insulin based on the average amount of carbohydrate they consume at a given meal, or the more sophisticated patient can receive nutritional education and learn to calculate the amount of carbohydrate that they are about to consume at a given meal and dose their rapid-acting insulin based on a ratio of insulin to carbohydrate. In many of my patients, I initially take a detailed diet history, get an estimate of how much carbohydrate they eat at each meal, and then give them a prescribed dose of rapid-acting insulin for each meal. I have them monitor their glucose levels frequently and report their readings back to me in several days to a week and then adjust their doses. You titrate the pre-meal bolus based on the glucose level either two hours after a meal or the glucose level prior to the subsequent meal. You can add a correction dose of insulin pre-meal if the glucose levels are elevated or the pre-meal dose can be decreased if the glucose levels are below target. In many of my patients who want more control over their meal and insulin, I have them learn to count carbohydrates and adjust their insulin meal to meal. I will also have them report their glucose levels back to me so I can customize their carbohydrate ratio as I see how they respond to the mealtime insulin. So this patient is started on Levomir insulin, 10 units at night, with the instructions to increase his dose by two units every two days until he achieves a fasting glucose of 120. He's also started on Novolog insulin before each meal using a correction scale of two units for every 50 milligrams per deciliter. His finger stick is over 150. I continued his metformin and Victoza therapy with the aim that the correction scale won't be necessary and the Levomir dose will be continued to be titrated and the patient will not need any Novolog at all. After one month, his fasting glucose level is down to 112, but his glucose levels two hours after meals continue to remain elevated at 185 to 220. I referred him for nutritional education at the Geckel Diabetes Center to learn how to carbohydrate count, and subsequently he starts a meal coverage of one unit of Novolog insulin for every 15 grams of carbohydrate he is going to consume at each meal. At this point, I stopped his Victoza therapy. Clearly, it was not effective in controlling his post-meal glucose levels and isn't necessary. However, I do continue his metformin therapy. It's my experience that stopping metformin increases insulin requirements, and patients need a much, much higher dose of insulin once metformin has been stopped. At his three-month follow-up appointment, his hemoglobin A1c is down to 6.8%. He is now taking Levomir insulin 34 units at night and Novolog 6 to 9 units depending on his glucose level and his carbohydrate consumption. He's continuing to watch his diet and he's exercising regularly. At his 6-month follow-up appointment, his urine microalbumin to creatinine ratio has improved to 35 and is nearly normal, and his hemoglobin A1c has remained controlled at 6.6%. This concludes my lecture on insulin therapy in the management of type 2 diabetes. Please feel free to contact me or any of my colleagues at Baywest Endocrinology Associates if you have any additional questions or patients that you would like us to see in consultation. In addition, I would strongly recommend you consider sending your patients to the Geckel Diabetes Center located here at GBMC if you would like them to have general diabetes education or nutritional education. Mm -hmm.